Welcome to Wobblers Live with David Barton and Rick Green. A lot of you have seen the American Heritage series with David Barton. Well, the sequel has now come out, building on the American Heritage series. You can actually order it at our website right now at wallbuilders.com. Here we go to building on the American Heritage series with David Barton. All right, David, our topic today is the judiciary, and we do talk about judges a lot in the news these days, but sometimes I think our, our perception may be wrong about the proper role of the judiciary. It is. A lot of times our perception is based on what people tell us, especially what judges tell us. Judges try to define their role. The Constitution is what defines their role. And in the case of Christians, the Bible also clearly defines the roles of judges. And judges are a big deal in the Bible. Lots of passages that talk about the qualifications of judges, the behavior, the deportment of judges, how they conduct themselves. So the Bible has a lot to say about judges. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our early founding fathers of the American jurisprudence system, James Kent, said our, our whole system of appeals courts came out of the Bible because Samuel the judge rode from Gilgal to Mizpah, all these places to judge the people. And so that's why we have traveling courts that move from place to place. And so, so much of what we had in tradition actually came out of the Bible. But because we've lost that, we don't read the Constitution like we should, we've really gotten into a bunch of myths that we bought into today. I mean, we buy into the myth that federal judges are appointed for life. Founding fathers said, no, they aren't. The Constitution says, no, they aren't. But that's what most people believe. That's what most people think. Most people think the judiciary is an independent branch. No, it's not an independent branch. No branch is independent from the people. All three branches are accountable. There's tons of checks and balances in the Constitution to make sure the judiciary is not an independent branch. They were never to be separate from the other two branches as far as you guys can't touch us, we're yeah. the judges. No, n never at all in any way, shape, fashion, or form. Wouldn't that make any branch or any person despotic? They'd I mean, make, you'd have sure. a despot then. It, it, you can do anything you want if you can't be touched and held accountable for yeah. it. And, and that's never designed because the government comes from we the people. It's to reflect the consent of the government, as our, as our documents tell us. So. We have those kind of issues. We, we've also got issues. We're told that only only the, the judges get to decide what's constitutional or not. No, no, no. James Madison, the other guy, said all three branches get to decide what's constitutional. That's how you have checks and balances. The court may say it's constitutional. The other two branches say, no, it's not. And that's you know, a what? shocking one for people, David. It is. Because we, we think only the court can determine constitutionality. You're saying the president has the right to do that. Congress has the right to do that as well. In well, the case of one of the earliest examples is, is Congress passed a law called the Alien Sedition Act. It says if you criticize the government of the United States, you're going to jail. The court didn't strike it unconstitutional, but President Jefferson got in there and said, that is a wacky law. You can't throw people in jail for saying something bad about the government. Twenty-five people had been taken to court on, on that law. Ten were sitting in jail because of it. Mm. President Jefferson comes in and says, that's an unconstitutional law. Turned everybody out of jail. So all three branches have the ability to determine constitutionality. Yeah. You, you don't let just a body of nine people or the majority of nine people, five people, determine what's constitutional for the whole nation. No, no, no. no, no. That, 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 that's never part of the design. So they all, they all have the ability to do that. Are they all, we often hear they're equal branches. They're not equal branches. They're separate branches, but they're all accountable. Uh, as a matter of fact, the Federalist Papers right here, uh, very clear. Now, the Federalist Papers written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, both of them signed the Constitution, and John Jay, the original Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court. They say in here that the legislative branch predominates. That's the most powerful branch. They also say that the judiciary branch is the weakest of all the branches by far far the weakest. talks about the comparison. It says it has no power over the sword, over the purse. It can't influence society or policy. I mean, they go through and say, they're not co-equal. I said, legislative is the biggest branch because that's the one closest to the people. It's got the most power. You look at Article 1 of the Constitution, really long. The next most powerful branch is the executive because people choose the executive, but only every four years. So that Article 2 is a little shorter, but the tiniest article of all of the, of the three in the Constitution is Article 3, judiciary, because they're not chosen. They're not elected. Therefore, they get fewer opportunities to do anything. They have very limited opportunities. And so the, the founding fathers made real clear that they're not co-equal branches. As they said in the in Federalist Papers, the liberties of the people will never be endangered by the judges because they don't have any power. Wish it was still that way. Wish it was still that way. But those are some of the judicial myths we've grown to accept that are historically fallacious, and they're even biblically fallacious in, in, in many ways. And the Bible is the basis of our judicial system. It's just that most people don't know that, but we'll get to look at that. Well, because of how much judges have been influencing the culture lately, we've got a lot of questions on this one. Since our judges are appointed for a lifetime, how do we hold them accountable? Well, so where is the accountability if a judge is appointed for their whole life? Well, the, the first part is they're not appointed for life. That's one of the things that people think today, and this is one of the great judicial myths that's yeah. out there that's absolutely not accurate. Um, if you go back and look at the Constitution, Article 3 deals with judiciary. 
There's nothing in there about judges being appointed for life. They're not appointed for life. Matter of fact, you have to back up before that. You go back to 1765, the king was appointing judges in America. And starting in 1765, it was Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution, who started ringing the alarm bell saying, hey, we got a bad problem here. The king has started appointing judges for life over here. That's a really bad deal. And Sam Adams said, and the other bad deal is these guys are not accountable. And so as time went on, what would happen is the colonies would pass various laws and the king's judges would strike them down and say, you guys can't do that. So if they strike down a law, there's no recourse. There was no recourse for them. And and that's why they specifically made sure that once they got control of government and the British were out of it, they stopped that. There's no lifetime appointments and judges are accountable. But see, David, almost all of our people believe that they're lifetime appointments. I'll I'll go to a constitution class and I'll ask, okay, how long are judges appointed for? And I'm not kidding, 99% to 100% of the people lifetime appointments always will say yes, they're for lifetime. And that's uh, people coming out wanting to study. Let me me go back. Sam Adams is from Massachusetts. He's a founding father of America, but he's specifically out of Massachusetts. And Sam Adams helped do this book right here. That's the Constitution of Massachusetts of 1780. So what happened was in 1776, they declared independence in America, and then most of the states started writing their constitutions. 1776, Pennsylvania did. 1776, North Carolina wrote their state constitution, so did Virginia. They started working on that in Massachusetts, but they didn't get it written. And they worked and sent it back for revision. And so it's really 1779 before they, they get it done, and it's ratified, and it goes into effect in 1780. But Sam Adams has been working on this since the very beginning. Now remember, his two things about the judges, as the other founding fathers, is you can't have lifetime appointments, and these guys have to be accountable. So when they wrote the Massachusetts Constitution, they they addressed the issue of judges, but they addressed the issue of government in general. And it's a whole different paradigm from what they had under the British form of government. This is, this is after the Declaration. This is after this the is Declaration. before the U.S. Constitution. And, and by the way... Middle. Those who are at the Constitutional Convention who did the federal Constitution said they took ideas from, from state constitutions like that of Massachusetts. So here's what it says in the Declaration of Rights, right up front, setting forth fundamental principles that are never to be violated. This is how they'll operate their government. Item number five, it says, All power residing originally in the people and being derived from the people, the several magistrates and officers of government vested with authority, whether they're legislative, executive, or judicial, are the people substitutes and agents and are at all time accountable to the people. Now, they made real sure that we weren't going to have unaccountable judges. They're yeah. going to be accountable to the people. And specifically included the judiciary. The saying judiciary right there. Apart. There was never a design to have judges unaccountable to the people. But the other part is, well, how about lifetime appointments? What they did and what they also did in the federal constitution, when you read it, it says that judges are allowed to hold, federal judges are allowed to hold their appointments for the, quote, duration of good behavior. That's not a lifetime appointment. That's as long as you act right, you can stay there as a federal judge. But if you don't act right, we're going to take you out. Now, significantly, the U.S. Constitution has six clauses on how to remove judges. There's nothing else in the U.S. Constitution that gets as much attention as those six clauses. That's more content than any other subject that the Constitution gets. Six clauses on how to remove judges. So if the Founding Fathers had these clauses and said, we're going to make sure judges are accountable and that they don't get lifetime appointments, why would they have thrown a judge off the court? That's what I was going to ask you. If it says for good behavior, and then they have all these clauses for how to deal with bad behavior, what is bad behavior then? And that's or, a, or what is not good behavior, I guess is the right way to ask Well, it. the best way to know is go see the guys who wrote the clauses, see what they defined as good behavior by who they throw off the court. There was a federal judge thrown off the court because he cussed in the courtroom. That was enough. Founding fathers threw him off the court. Why'd they do that? Because the federal constitution says for the duration of good behavior. They said cussing in a courtroom is not good behavior for a judge. You're gone. Another guy was thrown off the court because he got drunk in his private life. Whoa, it's his private life. Had nothing to do with his judge. No, that's not good behavior for a judge. You're gone. Another guy got thrown off the court because he contradicted an act of Congress. The Supreme Court does that all the time today. Congress passed an act, ah, we don't like that act, it's unconstitutional. No, he, he did that. You're gone, buddy. See, our, our perception is that, that to do something like an impeachment, it has to be huge. It, yeah. has to be, it has to be a major, major deal. Those are not major. Those are not major deals. See, there, there have been 97 impeachment investigations across history with judges. You've had 13 impeachments actually taken off the court. And the more often you have an impeachment investigation, the less often you have to remove a judge. Because what happens, Thomas Jefferson said impeachment is a scarecrow. I mean, you sit out there in the middle of the field, and that'll scare them off. Because all the other judges are watching that going, I don't want that to you be me. Yeah. For example, take, take the judge in California that says, oh, no, having under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, completely unconstitutional. 
What you do is you convene a hearing in Washington, D.C. Congress says, hey, we want you to come appear before the, the Judiciary Committee and explain to us exactly what your thinking is that says we can't acknowledge God when that's in the Declaration and in the Constitution. What are you thinking? And other judges see him getting called before Congress to be accountable, and they go, oh, my gosh, we're not going to touch that. Exactly. Thomas Jefferson said whatever branch is independent is absolute also. If we let the judges be independent in that way, then we're letting them be absolute. The Congress isn't independent. We hold them accountable yeah. in elections. The president's not independent. We've got elections every four years. Judges are not independent. Congress holds them accountable. So they, they, they are accountable through Congress through to Congress us. In to other us. words, they're accountable you to bet. us, but Congress is the one that has to do their job in bringing in the courts. And see, that, that, that is the key thing with, with the courts, is that the Constitution set it up so that the other branches could check the court. Now, if the other branches refuse to do that, then judges do get lifetime appointments, yeah. and they are unaccountable if the other branches refuse to do Because we as individual this. citizens, that's right. We're, you just can't we, do much. We have sent people to Congress and the presidency who don't care what judges do. Yeah. You know, that, and if that's not an issue for us, it's not going to be an issue for a congressman. It's real simple. David, I think we've gotten an education on judges already, but let's get another question about it. Did juries play a more important role in the judicial process of previous generations? Okay, well, maybe this will shift us a little from the judge to the jury. What was the role of the jury in the past? You know, the, it's an interesting thing about the juries because there is a long history, and it actually has a lot of biblical basis on the history. Now, a hundred years ago, we called them courts of justice because they existed to ensure that justice occurred. Then, about 50 years ago, we went into what were called courts of law. We're not after judges. We're, we're after holding up the law here. The law is more important than justice is. And then the most recent thing is we've just become courts, nothing else. And when you look at the definition of courts in the legal books today, it says a court is a place to settle disputes. Now, if you go back to when you, you had courts of justice, the biggest entity, the most important entity in a court of justice was the jury. And the jury was more important than the judge. And from the time of the founding fathers till about the 1890s, juries were inseparable from any trial. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. In the minds of many today, government is a purely secular institution and is not in any way to be joined to religious principles. The result is that too often our public policies are now enacted without any consideration of their spiritual consequences. However, the Founding Fathers believed that even a political act should always be examined from a spiritual viewpoint. For example, in his inaugural address, President George Washington declared, we ought to be persuaded that the favorable smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. President George Washington believed that the blessings of heaven would reside on this nation only so long as its national policies embraced godly standards. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. The significant thing about juries, and the Founding Fathers said this right from the beginning, uh, John Jay and James Wilson, all these guys who, who wrote the Constitution, were on the Supreme Court, etc., they said that a jury is to examine both the law and the facts. So Daniel, who the law says you can't pray, um, he prayed anyway, he's brought to trial in an American court. The jury listens to everything that's gone on, and they say, you know, you violated the law, but the law is an unjust law. You're acquitted. You, you didn't do anything wrong because you're supposed to be able to pray according to the dictates of conscience. But if all they can it's, review are, are the facts, then they have to say, well, thing. yes, you prayed, and then the judge gets to decide on That's the law. That's right. But, but you're see, saying the way we used to do the way it, they we used do to do both it, facts The way they law. used to do it, juries were more important than the judge. And quite frankly, what would happen is any time the attorneys would argue about the points of law, they would never dismiss the jury. The jury's supposed to stay there and hear everything, every bit of evidence. Mm. Now, today we rule, oh, you can't let the jury hear oh, that yeah. evidence. You can't introduce this. You can't do that. You know, back then, they had to hear everything because the judge would have said, why, Daniel, you violated the law. You're going to the lion's den. you got to have a check and balance on the judge. And yeah. that was juries. Twelve jurors, twelve peers say, no way you're going to throw him in the lion's den for yeah. praying to God. There's no. And so it doesn't matter how much education the judge has, you got over here the check of the people, and that's the jury. Uh, boy, I, we miss that today, I'll tell you. The jury is really almost disdained. Well, see, the... what happened is in, in about 1890s, there in the 1890s, the Supreme Court came out with a new ruling and says, hey, from now on, Juries are not going to look at the law anymore. They'll only look at facts. Only facts yeah. We judges are the professionals. That's we'll it. tell you what the law is. Yeah. Now, at that point, your juries become a lot more insignificant. 
So when an attorney says, hey, judge, I think the law's wrong in that, okay, dismiss the jury, get them out of the room, let's talk about this back and forth. And then you bring the, the jury back, you don't let them hear the law. And, and, and what happens is if the jury today does what juries did under the founding fathers, said, hey, that's an unjust law, we're not going to convict on that, then suddenly the, the judge says, oh, mistrial, I'm the one who does the law, yeah. and you guys don't. You see, this is significant because in 1856, uh, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Law, one of the most abominable laws in history. It says if you're black and someone accuses you of having been a slave, even if you've been free your whole life, if I walk up and say, you used to be a slave, under that law, you instantly lost your constitutional right of habeas corpus. You lost your right to an attorney, constitutional right. You lost your constitutional rights simply because I said you used to be a slave. There was no due process. There was no examination, nothing at all. And so what happened is the law was so bad that the, the federal law says if a black is accused of, of being a former slave and he comes into court and the judge finds that he was not a former slave, the judge gets paid five bucks. If the judge finds that he was a former slave, the judge get pays ten bucks. So you're paying. You're, you're paying the judge. Incentivizing the judge to That's always right. find one. So guess them. how many mm. cases with judges they found the, the black to be not a former slave. Very, it's like one percent. Yeah. But the jury consistently freed people under that because they thought the law was unjust. You had Quakers, for example, that would help escape slaves in the South and get to the North and the Underground Railroad. They would take the Quakers and put them on trial for violating the Fugitive Slave Law, and the jury would say. They didn't do anything wrong. The law is bad. And so the juries kept acquitting all these people. Yeah. And see, then the courts come in 1892 and say, oh, juries, you, you got too much power. We need to limit your power. So they do that. And at that point, juries now become a lot less significant. And then we get to about 30, 40 years ago where we said, you know, no, we, we don't even need juries deciding facts. Let's just do it for the judge. And, and if you don't like the law, we'll just strike it down for you and we'll settle the dispute. Now, the problem with that is the use of juries as part of the due process clause of the Constitution, the fourth through the eighth amendments. Here's where it gets really fun. These three books I'm going to pull right here. These are really big books. These and they, these are old books too. This is from 1590. This is this one also comes out of the 1500s. This happens to be the 1794 edition. But this is called the Geneva Bible. It was the Bible that preceded the King James version of the Bible. Uh, this particular Geneva Bible that we've got right here is from 1590. This was brought to America by one of the Puritan Pilgrim families. But what makes the Geneva significant is that when you open the Geneva Bible up, on the inside, it is loaded with all these commentaries down the margins right there. You see all that? Yeah. This is the writings of the Reformers back in the day when they said, hey, we've been away from the Bible for a thousand years. We've got lousy traditions. Time to get back to the Bible. So th these are commentaries taking the scripture and, uh, and actually applying it. Saying, how we ought to be doing it in our culture. What they did was said, we've had the culture wrong for a thousand years. It's time to go back to the Bible. So these are comments. One of the things they have tons of comments on is we've let the judicial system get away from what the Bible says. And it went, there was trial of Jesus. There, there was trials of Paul. There were trials throughout the Bible. And they said, look at the, the, the policies you have with trials. Look what God says about trials. And so these are all the comments here. Well, part of the problem with trials was the king would head the established church and the king would say what the doctrine was. And if you said, we disagree with that doctrine, the king would put you to death. In the case of Wycliffe and Tyndall and Huss, they were burned at the stake because they simply put the Bible down in a common language where people could read it. Uh, you have other people who were killed. The, the, the pilgrims were persecuted because they didn't attend the church services of the church the king told them to go to. They had their own church. They had a home church. And the king says, ah, you're going to be fine. Every Sunday you don't go to my church. Uh, so over and over you have people being tried because of their religious belief in courts. Now, the three courts in Britain that usually tried those guys were the Star Chamber Courts, the Courts of the High Chancery, and the Admiralty Courts. And in those courts, the judge had everything, and there was no other outside input. They would take testimony from people not sworn under oath. They would take hearsay testimony. It wouldn't even be direct testimony. You were not allowed to have an attorney to defend you. Uh, you were forced to incriminate yourself, often by torture. Rick, do you believe this? No, I don't believe that. Well, I'll drive a stake through your hand, see if you believe it now. Mm -hmm. And so after enough torture, you'd confess to it. So all of this happens. And as a result, these reformers really criticized the English judicial system as a violation of scriptures. That's when King James came out with his Bible. Now, here's, we're talking original King James here. This King James Bible comes out, and interestingly, it wipes out the commentaries. It, it doesn't want anybody complaining about what's going on. We've been doing this for a thousand years. Let's just keep doing it. So you'll find that there's very little text differences in the King James from the Geneva. The text differences deal with judicial areas. In the trial of Jesus, in the trial of Paul, and other trials, it doesn't read the same as the Geneva wow. Bible did. It, it reads different. Now, the next thing that happens is these books right here. These books right here, these are really old. This, this came out in the 1500s. This is called Fox's Book of Martyrs. 
Okay, and it's and it's got here, and it shows the first martyrs being Jesus Christ and the apostles and etc. So it lists martyrs. It's two volume set listing all these martyrs that happened, and consistently through here they show these guys were martyred because of bad judicial process. They were martyred because the right judicial process was not used in the courts. So this is what they have in Great Britain. These three books here, when they come to America, they say, we're not doing this. We've had bad courts. The Fourth through the Eighth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution, the Due Process Clauses, are all based on these three books right So the here. very reason they put those protections in our Constitution... Juries especially. It all comes from the knowledge they had of these things. Uh, of these examples. The witch trial. We always hear about the witch trial and how terrible that was. And 27 people put to death in the witch trial. And, yeah, that's terrible. 27 people put to death. But there's something else about the witch trial we never talk about. And that is three Christian ministers are the ones who got it stopped. They went to Governor William Phelps of Massachusetts. They said, Governor... Look at the biblical rules of evidence to be used in courts of law. You're not doing that. These were pastors. These right? were pastors. John Wise, and Chris Mather, and, and Thomas Brattle. Because we're always taught, when we're taught the story of the Salem Witch Trials, the pastors anything. are the bad guys. Pastors are the bad guys. Yeah. No, no. It was the government putting people to death. The pastors went to the, to the governor and said, you got to stop this. Governor called Samuel Sewell and said, look, we've been violating the scriptures. We can't do this. They called it into the trials. Sewell got up in church and repented. The governor called for a day of, uh, of, of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, seeking to avert God's judgment. Pastors brought it into it. Now, the, the significant thing is you had 27 people put to death in, in the Massachusetts witch trials. Hey, there were witch trials going in Europe at the same time. 500,000 put to death over there. See, this is what government was doing. It was the pastors who stepped in and said, no, 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 we, th this is our heritage. We don't want this kind of stuff going in the courts. So we, we, our guys obviously were wrong for the 27. 27. The pastors came in and corrected it because of well, what Well, the reason knew. it wasn't 500,000. Yeah, and then you compare that to 500,000 right. who was never correct. You know, right. They never got the jury system right. They never came back See, in. See, even in U.S. Right Supreme Court Justice Stephen Breyer, who on, is on the court, he is not a Christian, he's not a conservative, yeah. even he says the due process clauses come out of the Bible. The due process clauses the Constitution. So when you look at the role of juries, juries were part of helping reach justice. Yeah. And by the way, when 18, in the 1890s when the court says, oh, by the way, we don't need juries doing this anymore, we the judges will do it, but you know, that's the first time ever we had courts of appeal in the United States. We never needed courts of appeal because the people were the final word. Yeah. If the jury gave a ruling that you were innocent of something, it didn't go anywhere else. It stopped, right? I've already learned more in 30 minutes with you on the judiciary than I did in three years of law school, but let's still try to get one more question. Shouldn't our judges be neutral with no political agenda. So should the courts, or the judges, I guess, be influenced by the political process? Well, judges should be influenced by political process because it is not their duty to make law. It is their duty to enforce the laws, interpret the laws, not to decide whether they would have done the law differently. Um, quite frankly, when you go back a few years ago when all the stuff with the war on terror was going, and Congress went to Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution, says we are given the authority to make all the regulations for land and sea forces and for all the tribunals of those who are combatants against the U.S. And the court came up and said, ah, we don't like that. We, we think that they should be civil trials. And, and so the court went through and rewrote what Congress did because the court didn't like. It wasn't a matter of constitutional or not. It's a matter of we got a different opinion on what the policy yeah. should be. Now, it's back to what you said earlier in the program about it's a place to settle disputes. They were settling right. that public They were dispute settling a dispute. Rather that's than letting not Congress their role. Their role is not to settle disputes. Congress makes the laws. And if Congress quotes explicit constitutional language to do what it did, and the court said, well, we don't like that. We want a different policy. No, no, no. That's making the court a political body. They're supposed to take their guidance from Congress, uphold that, enforce it. What the, what the court is asked to do is, was the jury decided right? Was the law applied fairly? Not whether the law was up, up or down on, on good or bad. And see, that's where the court has really gotten out of bounds and turned itself into a political entity. Uh, I point back to the 2010 election. The people of Iowa really made themselves very clear on this. And in Iowa, after 161 years of marriage, meaning one man and one woman, by unanimous decision, the Supreme Court of Iowa said, well, we think 161 years is wrong. We want something different. And so the people stepped up, and there were retention elections that year. And out of the seven Supreme Court justices, three were up for retention election. In other words, you can check in or out. It's just, you don't they get don't a choice. They don't have an opponent, but you, have can, an opponent. you can vote no. I don't want this That's judge right. to come back. And I was interviewed a lot in that because I did several meetings in, in Iowa at the time. And, and my line was real simple. Hey, these judges have just made themselves legislators. They're no longer judges. They decided to create policy out of thin air. I recommend that you send those three guys home so they can run for the legislature because that's evidently where they want to be. So, so that wasn't that wasn't politics influencing the judge. That was that was the judges creating policy and making exactly. Policy. Yeah. And, and and that is wrong. That is absolutely wrong. They're they're not to do that. Uh, the Federalist Papers right here. Uh, the Federalist. The question came up of will judges be able to make policy? 
And this book right here, the greatest commentary ever on the Constitution, written by guys who did the Constitution and yeah. guys on the first Supreme Court, they said there's not a syllable in the Constitution that authorizes the judges to judge the spirit of the Constitution. No, no, they don't have a whit of authority to do that. And so when you have, like you do in so many states where you can elect judges or retain them, the people then do become the final authority. Judiciary is not to be an independent branch of the people. No way, shape, fashion, or form. And they're not to be the ones that shape politics. You know, they, they had an election in Missouri where the people said, hey, we don't want this tax increase. A judge came in and said, yes, you do want this tax increase, even though you voted down, and this is what your tax increase is going to be. Sorry, Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution says nobody can institute a tax increase except the House of Representatives. Not even the Senate nor the President can increase taxes. Only the House. And yet this judge said, but I want to increase the tax. I think there needs to be more money for education. So we're going to order a statewide tax on everyone. You have case after case after case of judge coming in, making policy, or not liking what the people decided, or not liking what the Congress did. Not a matter of being unconstitutional. They call it unconstitutional because they don't like it. Yeah. But then they implement their own opinions. And that is never, ever, ever to occur right back to this Constitution. The people are in charge of the government. They're in charge of all three branches. They're in charge of the judges as well. Thanks for listening today, folks. Many of you have the DVD set of the American Heritage Series. You can now get the sequel, which is building on the American Heritage Series. A lot of new material, some fantastic programs you want to you have in your library. You can get it at our website today at wallbuilders.com.